at this moment, I would like to and have the privilege of introducing to you Mr. Clint Bunting. He is, as many of you know, right from this area now. He's relocated uh, from, wa oh, born in Waterloo, went to California, and had, a, had an Abrahamic type call to come back to this area, Jessup. And we're just honored to be able to have him preach this morning as our candidate for a future pastor, Clint. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, good morning. It is good to be in the house of the Lord today. Um, there's no snow yet, so uh, praise God for that. I know it's coming, I know it's coming. But I just really wanna thank, before I even get started this morning, I wanna thank the Pastor Search Committee, and Pastor Paul for even allowing me here to preach even one time. It's a, a blessing and an honor. Uh, preaching the Word of God is something that I do not take lightly at all. And so I thank you for that. I want to thank, you know, I, I, I joked with you guys once before that I'm in, always in search of my amen corner. Uh, I brought my own this morning. I brought my own just in case. Uh, not only are they my amen corner, they're my bodyguards this morning. Uh, Mama Miles and Aunt Deb, I thank you for being here. Of course, my wife for putting up with me. Um, it's not an easy task, but we'll make it through. But so today I want to keep it, keep it real, real simple. I have a, a message this morning about faith. This is a message that I've preached to myself repeatedly and even daily over the past three years, ever since my wife and I decided to follow God and pack up our entire lives and move to Jessup in obedience to a call God has on our life. And you see, sometimes people ask me, is it, is it difficult to get up there and preach, and, and my answer always is, the truth is, preaching is the easy part. Practicing what you preach is a difficult part, and so I preach this very same message to myself multiple times over the last three years at three in the morning through tears and anxiety and through struggle, and, and I've had to preach this message to myself even through critics and, and those that uh, lovingly thought I lost my mind. To pack up and move and to follow God in an uncertain and unknown journey of faith. And as much as I loved it, I even preached this message to me when I was, yes, living with my mother-in-law the last few months. We were in California. <laughs> Fellas, if you know how that would feel. <laughs> Mind you, I'm telling her I'm taking her daughter 1,500 miles away. Uh, so yeah, I preached it a lot. But as, as much as I understand what this weekend is, this pastoral candidate weekend, and I am humbled by it, um, I, I need to get something out of the way before we even get into the text this morning that I must tell you that as much as I know what this is here this weekend, um, I must say that if you focus on me and not on Jesus, you'll be missing the point. And so we're going to focus on Jesus. I believe he has something for you. Jesus is always first. He must be exalted, for we are just his servants. So I want to preach about faith, 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 personal faith in Jesus Christ, real and authentic faith in Jesus, faith in Jesus as the absolute and absolute object of our faith, faith not in any of our talents, our abilities, faith not in the security of our bank account, faith not in the security of another person, but faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. You see, in order for faith to be real and truly have an effect on your life now and in eternity, it is vitally important that your faith be of great substance. 
Your faith is only as strong as the one you put your faith in. If the object of your faith can fail, then you're standing on shaky ground. But if you're standing on Jesus Christ, then you're standing on the rock. In order for faith to be truly work in your life, it has to be based on something that is eternal, uncreated, and sovereign. And I don't know about you this morning, family, but my faith is in Jesus Christ. If you would turn your Bibles to the book of Luke, Starting in chapter 8, verse 22, be the reading of the word this morning. Luke 8, 22 through 25 is where our text comes from. Jesus as the object of our faith. Luke 8, 22 says it like this. It says, one day he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him saying, master, master, we are perishing. And he awoke and he rebuked the wind and the raging waves and they ceased and there was a calm. He said to them, where is your faith. And they were afraid and they marveled, saying to one another, who then is this that he commands even winds and water and they obey him? Heavenly Father, we come before you today humbled and in awe of who you are. Jesus, I ask you make yourself big here today, that my words would be your words, that, that my words would be as sharp as arrows, that someone would walk out of here strengthened in their faith. We thank you in advance. Have your way in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. So family, as I analyze my own preaching ministry since I started preaching about 15 years ago, I must say that if I can go back over all my sermons, especially uh, early on in my ministry, and be able to speak to those that I led to Christ through preaching during the first few, year, few years, I would like to, if I could, apologize. And I would not apologize because I was wrong theologically or because I compromised the Word of God, but I would apologize apologize because out of the first few sermons and few years of ministry, out of excitement, I believe that my preaching had at certain times a certain lean to it when it came towards offering Christ. You know, a lot of preachers that we preach powerful sermons and we point to Jesus and then we get to the end of the sermon and we offer an invitation and a preacher will offer an invitation for sinners to commit their lives to Jesus. But but then we tend to just lean towards communicating that when you become a Christian, the battle in your life is over. And at times we lean towards communicating that when you become a Christian, that you will then breeze through life on a, uh, the highway to heaven, uh, floating on clouds of happiness and joy. And because we are so excited that to see that God is changing a life, we attend to uh, put to portray an idea that the struggle is now over. When in actuality, uh, tell me if you understand, the act in actuality the struggle doesn't uh, end when someone becomes a Christian. In fact, the struggle just begins. So you see, it's uh, extremely important to analyze who and what your faith is in. And so I want to encourage you to understand today that Jesus is the object of your faith because point number one this morning, your faith will stand trial. Family, the, the struggle for Christians living in this fallen world is an even greater struggle than an unbeliever. It's an even greater struggle for us as Christians because we're living in this fallen world, in this house that is not our home. In fact, we are just passing through on the way to our heavenly home. And when you're living in a house that's not your own, you really shouldn't be too comfortable. 
You see, our faith in Jesus will stand trial, and faith has to be tested, and faith has to be tried in order to remove the impurities, but also to prove that real faith doesn't come from an emotionally driven moment where you raise your hand, where you walk down an aisle, where you sign a card. You know, raising your hand in church doesn't make you a Christian. Uh, uh, Walking down an aisle doesn't make you a Christian. Learning new Christian lingo doesn't make you a Christian. Knowing when to stand and when to sit down in church doesn't make you a Christian. Even serving in church doesn't make you a Christian. But but, but what, what, what makes you a Christian is that you have placed all your faith and all your trust in Christ Jesus as Savior and as Lord over your life. And see, the thing about that is we understand that, we clap for it, but see, many people want to trust Jesus as Savior. Many people want to trust Jesus as Savior to save them from a situation, to save them from a bad decision. Uh, uh, But beyond that, they don't want to follow him as Lord over their life. Savior, Savior is fine. I can admit that I need to be saved from some stuff. But Lord, but Lord, oh, hold on, Uh, another word for Lord, let me break it down real simple. Another word for Lord is boss, (laughs) is master. Savior is fine, but but Jesus as my boss, Jesus as my, uh, who's in charge of me, as my, my master, ah, that's a whole nother thing. You know, I need a savior to save me, but Jesus telling me what to do? I don't know about that all the time. Walking in holiness? Ah, I don't know about that all the time. Not saying what I want to say to people? I don't know about that all the time. But see, Jesus has to be savior, but he also has to be Lord. You know, it's so much easier to just attend church once in a while and try not to uh, cuss people out and try not to cheat on your taxes. But all true faith, all true faith will stand trial. And it's when you are seriously making an impact in the kingdom of God that your faith will especially be tested. For the enemy doesn't attack anyone or anything that is not effective. It's like the basketball player in the NBA who can't shoot from the three-point line. No one's guarding him no matter how much he stands out there with the ball. And so in Luke chapter 8 this morning, we find disciples in the midst of this three-year training session with Jesus, for Jesus was training these men to eventually change the world forever. And verse 23 says, and one day he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. And so they set out and they sailed. As they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were all filling with water, and they were in danger. And you see, these disciples were going about their devoted life, following Jesus, and suddenly a storm hit. And suddenly, without much warning, their faith was on trial. Isn't it interesting, family? Isn't it interesting how a storm of life hits you just when and even when you're trying your best to follow closely after Jesus? Isn't it interesting how a trial of faith hits you even when when you're trying to fulfill the call of God on your life. You see, these disciples, they were just simply obeying Jesus. They told him, Jesus said, let's go on the other side of the lake. They went on the other side of the lake. When suddenly a storm hit. I don't know about you, but have you ever had a suddenly in your life? Things are going well. You're following Jesus. You're devoted to Jesus. And suddenly a storm hits. They were on trial. Your faith will stand trial. Clue number one that that the disciples' faith was small and weak is that they immediately, when this storm hit, they immediately went into a state of agitation, into a state of fear, into a state of terror and alarm. And you see, instead of standing on whatever amount of faith they had in Jesus, what did they do? They stood out and they acted out on their feelings. JBF, I must tell you, beloved brothers and sisters, that faith is not just a feeling. For we are never to be carried around by a feeling, but because feelings change from moment to moment. But God is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. 
the disciples were guilty of allowing their feelings to drown out their faith. And they were in a state of confusion. And they were in a state of panic. And from uh, the moment, they were out of control. And that's why the Bible tells us not to be drunk with wine, but to be filled with the Spirit. Because a person who is led by anything other than this Holy Spirit is in danger of being out of control. And when you're out of control, you place your faith on the back burner. And you begin to act out in the flesh. And so when we are controlled by feelings and not faith, the prosecution in the trial of faith has got some evidence. Ah, ah, they got some evidence against you that your faith is weak. And all this leads to irrational living, for feelings are often irrational, and they change from moment to moment. Family, if we look at the text this morning, you see, yes, the disciples were going through a storm. But that didn't mean they had the right to act crazy and act out on feelings, because there was no reason to fear. You say, Clint, Pastor Clint, that's weird. Because the text says there was a rainstorm, a windstorm, that water was going in the boat. Uh, this seems like there was a reason to fear. But, family, I must tell you this morning, there was no reason to fear. Yes, I know the storm was raging. Yes, I, I know they can see the storm clouds. Yes, they can feel the, the rocking of the, the, the wind and the waves. And, and, and yeah, they were scared. But they had no reason to fear. Why did they have no reason to fear? They had no reason to fear because Jesus was in the boat. Jesus was in the boat. And brothers and sisters, I don't know what type of storm, what type of trial of faith you're in, but you need to know that if you're a believer in Christ, that Jesus is in your boat. Do you have a medical concern that keeps propping up? That's okay. Jesus is in the boat. Do you have financial stress this morning? It's okay. Jesus is in the boat. Are you worried about your kids and worried about your marriage and, and all that? Yeah, 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 you might, but Jesus is in the boat this morning. Are you uh, struggling with feelings of insecurity and fear of the future in this unprecedented season in our country? You might be. That's okay. Jesus is in the boat. Whatever storm you're going through, don't act on feelings. Just know that Jesus is in the boat. And so we family, we got to realize that the truth of the matter is that Jesus in his unwarranted grace was never not in your boat. Jesus has always been right there. He's always been there by your side, even when you didn't know it. Jesus was right there by your side when you were running the opposite direction from him. Jesus was right there in the boat when your boat was full of unforgiveness and bitterness and anger. Jesus was still in your boat. Jesus was in your boat when you were in the club or the bar on a Saturday night. Jesus was in your boat when you were abused and mistreated. And taken for granted and laughed at, Jesus was right there in the boat. Jesus was in your boat when what should have happened to you didn't happen to you. Ah, Jesus was in your boat when you deserved his wrath, but he gave you his mercy instead. How do I know this? Let me prove it to you. I know that Jesus was in your boat because Ephesians 1, 4, and 5 says this. It says, he chose us in him. When did he choose us? Before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and that we should be blameless before him. And in love, in his love, he said, I'm going to get into this person's boat even though they don't deserve it. Later on somewhere, the Apostle Paul tells his young disciple Timothy that we were not given a spirit of fear, but of power and self-control. And when we act out on feelings of fear, we tend to speak nonsense instead of the truth. Usually we speak nonsense in our mind to ourselves, and then we let, marinate it in our thought life, and we think about all the things that could happen, right? And all the things that we're afraid that's going to happen. But sooner or later, we start, start speaking that nonsense to other people, and the disciples did just this. They, they saw the elements, they saw the danger, and they said, Master, Master, we're perishing. They were such, in such a panic that they woke Jesus up and, and, and throw this uh, scolding accusation at him. And they said, don't you even care? You're over here sleeping. We're in danger. Don't you even care? Don't you even care that we're in danger, that this storm is going to kill us? And family, I don't want to seem raw and less than polished this morning, but the disciples should have been chilling out. Why? Because Jesus was chilling out. <laughs> Disciples shouldn't have gone crazy. 
Because they have Jesus in the boat. But sometimes we find ourselves in such a storm of life that we do the same thing, don't we? We get to a point where our faith is real weak, and instead of remembering who God is, we end up questioning how truly good God is. We end up questioning if God is going to bring you through this. And since we're all family here this morning, and, and I believe in being authentic, I know I'm up here preaching big about faith, but I've had my moments. I've had my moments. There was a moment, uh, uh, my wife will tell you, in the middle of uh, winter this past year, and I, I, I looked over to her, I said, I want to go home. I want to go home. It's cold. It is cold out here. My, my, my uh, uh, truck door was ice shut. Uh, I got that through that, and I walked down the pathway, and I slipped on some ice. Uh, there's no ocean around here, you know, just this little river. You know, I wanted to go home. I wanted to go home. I, I, I was panicking. I was in this state of agitation. And you see, we all have our moments of weakness, don't we? Am I the only one? Where we momentarily forget how good God truly is. We forget that God knows all things and he's already prepared a solution for your problem. We forget that God knows the end from the beginning and that he has already made a way of escape for you. We get beside ourselves and we forget that all power is in his hands and we forget that Jesus is before all things and that he holds all things together. We forget that all things work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And our faith gets real weak, and we get in this sense of panic, and then we turn inward. And we start trying how we can figure it out. And we stay up all night. And it ends up being like rocking in a rocking chair. You're doing a lot of movement, but you're not going anywhere. So we must remember that when you're in a storm, when you're in a trial of faith, when your faith is on trial, you will be called to testify. And when you are called to testify of one of God's children, you're either put forth a testimony of how great God is, or your testimony is that of fear and trembling. But either way, make no mistake about it, there is a live audience watching you. This live audience is looking for some hope, and this live audience is, is looking for, for someone to stand firm. This live audience is the exact people that God is trying to influence through your life of faith. This live audience is a live audience that uh, is living in a dying world full of strife and discouragement and depression. And God is asking us to reflect the light of his son, Jesus Christ, so we can be used of him to bring others into a joyous relationship with Jesus. So up until this point, there's mounting evidence that the disciples' faith was weak, and you may feel the same way about yourself here this morning. But family, Jesus is the object of your faith. Your faith will stand trial. Number two, what do we do with this? As your faith is standing trial, number two, as Jesus is the object of our faith, what must we do with it? Well, we must exercise our faith. What do you mean by exercise our faith? I mean that in order for your faith to be active, in order for your faith uh, to be strong, you have got to exercise it. Your faith has to be active. Your faith has to move you to get past feelings of fear and put your faith into operation. Verse 24 says it like this. And they went and they woke up saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased. And there was a calm, and he said to them, where is your faith? Jesus again proved his sovereignty and how he's worthy to be worshipped and praised as he woke up out of his nap there uh, that afternoon and he wiped the sleep out of his eyes and he calmed the storm. And then he asked us, the disciples a question that seemed odd at first and he said, um, where is your faith? Now we know these disciples had a measure of faith because we know in Luke chapter 5 uh, it says that after Jesus called them they left everything and followed Jesus. So it wasn't that these disciples didn't have any faith. They had faith. At least 11 of the 12 of them had faith because we know that they all 11 of them followed Jesus all the way to their own violent death. They might have had a little faith, but the word tells us that even if we have the, uh, say, the faith of the size of a puny mustard seed, then the mountains can still be moved. 
So Jesus wasn't saying to them uh, that they didn't have any faith. What Jesus was saying to them was, why are you not applying your faith in me to the situation you're in? You see, JB, a family of disciples had faith because of their feelings of fear. They weren't using their faith in this situation. They weren't operating in their faith. They weren't exercising their faith. Their faith was laying dormant. And, and when it should have been activated, the moment they felt the wind, the moment they saw the rain. So how do we exercise our faith? Number one, real practical this morning. The first thing we have to do to exercise our faith, we have to refuse to allow any situation to control you. Uh, refuse to allow any situation to control you. Refuse to panic. I can uh, imagine these disciples that afternoon uh, in the boat were totally controlled by this situation they were in probably trying as hard as they could to shovel water out of the boat and frantically moving around, looking at the storm and panicking each moment as it passed. And as they were panicking, nothing productive was happening, considering they knew that Jesus was in the boat. Number two, the second thing we must do is remind ourselves of what you already know about Jesus. Remind yourself about what you already know about Jesus. They didn't understand everything about who Jesus was, but what did they already know about Jesus? They knew Jesus was a miracle worker. They knew Jesus healed the centurion's servant. They knew Jesus raised the widow's son from death. They knew Jesus had healed this paralyzed man. They knew Jesus had the power to call out demons. They knew Jesus had done miracles consistently as they followed him. But the question I have for you is what do you know? What do you know about Jesus? Knowing and being convinced of who Jesus is will help you activate your faith no matter how small it may be in the moment. Do you know? What do you know? What do you know? Do you know that Jesus disarmed the evil rulers and the authorities and made a public spectacle of them on the cross? Do you know that Jesus has all authority in his hands? Do you know that God never lost a battle and he's not going to start losing a battle now? Do you know? Do you know? Do you know that you're so valuable to God? That every hair on your body, on your head, is numbered. Not just counted, but numbered. Do you know? What do you know about Jesus? You see, faith in Jesus looks past the reality of what you see with your eyes. For faith is an assurance of things what? Hope for. And the conviction of things not yet seen. So that means, just because the storm is raging, that doesn't mean that the end isn't just around the corner. Faith always takes into account what the certain situation is. However, true faith always adds a but to it. Yes, the storm is raging, but Jesus is in the boat. Yes, there's a more month than I have money, but, but God is Jehovah Jireh. He's my provider. Uh, uh, yes, I was an enemy to God, but now I'm his friend. Yes, yes, I know that, that uh, uh, everything and uh, everybody in my life seems to be disjointed and out of control, but I have a God that calms the stores with only a few whispers of his word. Yes, I'm going through a trial right now, but storms don't last forever. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. And so we have to remind ourselves about what we already know about Jesus. Faith is reminding itself of the exceedingly great and precious promises in the Bible. And that God is faithful. How many of you know that God is faithful this, hour, this morning? That he's faithful. And then the third way to activate your faith is to throw all your faith directly at the situation you are in. Bring everything you know to be true of God, written in his word, and focus on God and not your problem. The Bible says, lean not on your own understanding, but trust completely in him, for he will make your paths straight. I've had to tell me, tell myself this many, many mornings. My wife will say, melatonin don't work for me. Tylenol PM don't work for me. NyQuil doesn't work for me. None of that works for me. When I'm up in the middle of the night, I have to remind myself to lean not. To lean not on your own understanding. 
I can't understand it. I've had to uh, stop trying to understand everything. I've had to stop trying to figure everything out. I've had to uh, stop uh, making up backup plans in case God doesn't come through for me. I've had to stop it. I've had to stop looking at Goliath in front of me and start looking at God. I've had to stop looking at that Red Sea with my enemies chasing me and stop looking, start looking at the God who splits the Red Sea. Exercise your faith by believing what God says in his word and not what the enemy keeps whispering in your mind. So brothers and sisters, Jesus is the object of our faith. Our faith will stand trial. Number two, you must activate your faith. And number three, I want you to know that your faith can be small as long as your faith moves you to call on the name of Jesus. By all accounts, the disciples were failing their trial of faith. They were panicking. They were going crazy. They were throwing scolding accusations at, at Jesus, acting like Jesus didn't even care. By all accounts, they were failing their test of faith. But they did one thing right. <laughs> they did one thing right. And if we can get this one thing down, we're going to be all right too. They were failing their test of faith, but they did one thing right. They called on the name of Jesus. They called on the name of Jesus to save them from the storm. You see, they only had the faith of a tiny mustard seed, but praise God that it only takes the faith of a small mustard seed to move that mountain in your life, to get you through your storm. How do I know that? Romans 10, 13 says it like this, that for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, 9 says it like this, if you confess with your mouth, with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 10 says it like this, for it is with the heart one believes and is justified and it is with the mouth that one confesses and is saved. Ah, uh, that's good news this morning. I know you're quiet. I'm going to get you out of that quietness one day. But uh, that's good news this morning. That's good news this morning in the middle of a pandemic. That's good news in the middle of political tension. That's good news in uncertain times. That if we call on the name of Jesus, he will answer us. So when we cry out to Jesus with our whole heart, when we go to him with all of our burdens and even with all of our sin and even with all of our mistakes and even with all of our struggles and insecurities and even lack of faith, when we cry out to Jesus with our whole heart, he will forgive us. He will draw close to us. He might discipline us at times like a good father would do, but he will not turn away. He will not ignore the cries of his children. God wants us to be strong in him. And he wants us not to panic. And he wants us to apply our faith. And he wants us to, yes, grow on into maturity. Where we don't get so easily rocked by these storms. But even when we fail, <laughs> this is good news. Even when we fail, he will not turn us away. <laughs> He will receive us as his children. Jesus, Jesus didn't turn the disciples away. He received them and he will receive you. We have to cry out to God, family. With all of our praise and all of our worship, despite the snickers and the negativity of others around us, we have to press on and focus on Jesus. And never miss the opportunity to come to the altar, to come to the feet of Jesus and lay your burdens down. You know, God is so very pleased when his church gathers, when his church gathers and we worship his name and, and, and we praise his name and we focus on God. It's an amazing thing because right now there's other parts of the world that they can't do this openly. They've got to hide in basements and they've got to hide in, in, in people's houses. But it's an amazing thing that we shouldn't take for granted that we can all come together as God's children, brothers and sisters in the Lord and call on the name of Jesus. And to be a true family of God, there's got to be authenticity in the church house. 
where someone can bring all their burdens to the altar and cry out to the Lord. Uh, but the truth of the matter is sometimes we don't feel comfortable crying out to Jesus, even in the church house. And so I don't know about you, but we've probably all been guilty at one another of judging someone and how they're crying out to God. And, and sometimes we think it doesn't take all that to uh, cry out to God. I know I've been guilty of that myself. I see someone crying out to God, I, and I say, you know, I don't know what's up with them. And, and later on, I find out that uh, someone in their family just passed away. And they're worried about something. There's got to be authenticity in this house. A lack of judgment in this house. To where if you're crying out to God, I'm crying out right there with you. Crying out to Jesus. You see, the disciples were raw, but they were as, uh, as authentic as they possibly could be. They cried out to Jesus. They, they said, Master, Master, help us, we're perishing. It may not have been pretty, but our family it was effective. Jesus is the object of our faith. You must know that your faith will stand trial. You must activate your faith. Your faith can be strong as small as long as you call on the name of Jesus. And number four, finally, Jesus is the object of our faith. So we can rest. We can rest that he's in control. Jesus rebuked and calmed the storm and the rain. And this proved to them more of who Jesus truly was. It showed that Jesus is, is the son of God. It showed them by having power over nature that Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. That he was in control over everything. That, that it showed that Jesus is sovereign. That he's in control at all times and in every way. And so family, we can rest on that. It's why I love reading through the Psalms, because there's every type of emotion in the Psalms that you could ever feel. And there's every type of battle, physical, spiritual, whatever it is. And it's why I love to read through the Psalms, because David and the other writers knew what it was like to go through a trial of faith. Yet nothing stopped David from crying out to his God. And David had the type of faith that allowed him to rest, to rest in God. If he was hiding in the cleft of a rock and his enemies were after him, he still knew what it was like to take a nap and rest in God. And in Psalm 33, he gives a testimony of the steadfast love of the Lord. He says this, he said, the Lord brings the counsels of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the people. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is our Lord. The people who he chose as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven and he sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the heart of men, of them all, and observes their deeds. The king is not saved. By his great army, a warrior is not saved, delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by it, great might it cannot rescue. But behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, and on whose hope is steadfast, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive, even in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help. He is our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Family, Jesus Christ is the object of our faith. The old song says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the ro solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. We stand on the rock of Jesus Christ. And then I love the second half of verse 25 that says it like this and says, and they were afraid. Not at the storm anymore. They weren't in awe of the storm anymore. It says, and they were afraid and they marveled. They weren't marveling at the storm. They were marveling at Jesus Christ. And they were afraid and they marveled, saying to one another, who then is this? That he commands even the winds and the water 
and they obey them. Who then is this? Who then is this that commands the winds and the water and they obey him? Who then is this? Who then is this? Who then is this man? Who is this man? who is 100% God and 100% man, who then is this? The answer is, it's simply Jesus. It's Jesus. He's Jesus. He's the author and he's the perfecter of our faith. He's Jesus who stepped out of heaven, born of a virgin. It's Jesus who lived this perfect life so he can substitute himself for us on the cross. Who then is this that controls the storms in your life? It's Jesus. The same Jesus who was stretched wide and hung high. The same Jesus who died of violent death on the cross. The same Jesus who went down in an old rusty grave. It's Jesus who conquered sin, death, and the grave. It's Jesus who got up one Sunday morning with all power in his hands. It's who then is this? It's Jesus who ascended on high and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And what is he doing for you right now even as we speak? The Bible said he's interceding for you. Ah, that's why your strength won't fail. That's why your faith won't fail. Because even right now, Jesus is praying for us. Who then is this? It's Jesus. He's the Messiah. He's our Savior. Who then is this? This is uh, uh, the line of Judah who breaks every chain in your life. Who then is this? It's Jesus. And he even controls the weather. He even controls COVID-19. He controls your boss who's on your nerves. He controls your financial future that you're worried about. He is in control of this political climate. Uh, who then is this? It's Jesus. Who then is this? It's Jesus who came to destroy the works of the devil. Ah, that's good news this morning, isn't it? It's Jesus. Who then is this? It's Jesus, and he's inviting you right now as I speak to put your faith in him. To place your faith in Jesus. Make no mistake about it. Your faith is on trial. <laughs> you have an audience watching. The question is, will you trust him? In closing this morning, I only say this because I think it may help somebody. In 2018, at the start of my trial of faith, we made a trip out here, and I did it under protest. My dad wanted to go to his uh, school reunion here in Jessup, and he couldn't fly. And the Lord convicted me and said, you need to drive him. I love my dad. 1,500 miles in a car. <laughs> with a man who likes to talk <laughs> about things I don't even care about. <laughs> it was tough. But I took him out of honor to him, and, and I didn't want to come out here because this was the first time that I would be out here without my grandparents alive. And... I got him here and I checked him into his hotel. I checked into my hotel, <laughs> which was a nicer one, by the way. Um, <laughs> we joke when we got to go to Waterloo, my wife says, hey, there's your dad's hotel. Yeah, far away from mine. <laughs> but I took a little drive on July 4th, 2018, and I ended up in Fairbank down the road there by this river and, and, and I was sitting there, I was by myself and, and uh, it was a very peaceful time with God. I was enjoying this, the, about to be dark and it was silent and I'm just praising God, I'm just thanking God, having a peaceful time and then all of a sudden the fireworks started going off. I couldn't see them but I could hear them. And one of the two or three times in my life, the Lord spoke to me so very clearly, and he said that when you go back home, you're going to be in a trial of faith. And that I'm going to be asking you to put your faith in me, and I'm going to be calling you somewhere, and everything in your life is going to be rocked. And he said, I want you to go where I'm telling you to go. And that ruined my little peaceful moment. <laughs> But I immediately knew that it was true. And a sense of fear and dread and anxiety 
came over me and I, I said, I, I cried out to Jesus. I said, I know this is true, but what do you want me to do with this? Immediately, Isaiah 26 flooded my mind. And that word that said, you keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. You see, God was telling me to trust him, to place your faith in me, to lean not on your own understanding. God was telling me, you keep your mind stayed on me. And I'll bring you through. And family, I I need you to to know that three years later, I'm standing before you with a baby. It's about ready to be born. That that doctor said couldn't happen. I'm standing before you with a baby that's about to be born. That my bank account didn't said you can't do that. That's too much for you. The amount that's going to cost, experts said it couldn't happen. God willing, one month from today, our son will be born. God told me to trust him. Three years later, I'm standing before you anticipating a move of God on this community where lives will be changed, that uh, souls will be saved, and, and God will get the glory. That's three years later. But the question I have for you this morning is simple. Will you trust him? Will you focus on Jesus? Will you pass your test of faith by placing all your faith in Jesus? If you do that, you can't fail. You can't fail. If you never place your faith in Jesus, then today is the day to do it. I invite you to believe in Jesus and what he did on the cross. Repent of sin. Repent means to simply do an about face and turn to Jesus. And the Bible says that you will be saved. I invite you. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus, today is the day. If you're a Christian and you're struggling, I do invite you. Place your faith in Jesus.